So don't forget to follow me on Instagram, High Carb Health. Hit the follow button and click on the green H to see what I get up to. What I eat, what I do, it's all here. You can follow me and what I eat as well. So check it out guys. And often the first, the easy win mm. is to take dairy out. Yes. Uh, particularly um, for ulcerative colitis, mm. um, there's a high incidence of lactose intolerance. Mm. But the good news is that the benefits of a diet that limits or eliminates meat and dairy includes fiber, particularly fiber from fruit. Mm. Um, the benefits of that style of eating for inflammatory bowel disease, but in preventing and treating, mm. is entering the mainstream. The number one predictor of a healthy and diverse gut microbiome is the number and diversity of plants in your diet. We're here in Melbourne at the Nutrition and Healthcare Conference with Dr. Ellen Desmond. Welcome to the channel. Yeah, nice to meet you guys. And uh, thanks for reaching out. It's lovely to catch up with you at the conference. Yeah. And what a venue. It's going to be a lovely evening, oh, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be gorgeous. Fantastic. And Dr. Alan Desmond is a gastroenterologist and uh, we're very lucky to have him here because he's going to be presenting at the conference and talking all about some of the things that he's been researching. Um, so yeah. I guess I guess we can just start the interview with uh, you describing the talk that you're going to do. Yeah, well, I'm Dr. Alan Desmond. I'm a gastroenterologist. I, I work at a mainstream NHS hospital in the UK. I've also got a small private clinic. And I'm here speaking this um, conference, which is really focused on the overall health benefits of a whole food plant-based diet. And we'll be hearing from cardiologists and intensivists. We'll be hearing from some diabetes experts. And I think in the world of whole food plant-based diet and the evidence behind it, we hear a lot about uh, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and coronary vascular disease. Mm. And I mean, deservedly so, right? Sure. So, so these are conditions that are like the main drivers of premature mortality and mm -hmm. morbidity in the Western world. Yeah. And in many ways, these are lifestyle diseases which can be prevented and even reversed with right. a whole food plant-based diet. We're all familiar with Dr. Ornish's landmark work, uh, Dr. Esselstyn's work, Dr. Greger's books, etc. Mm. Dr. Neil Bernard's fantastic research. But mm. right alongside those conditions, I would place the inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, the evidence behind the role of diet and lifestyle in inflammatory bowel diseases over the last 15 years um, since I qualified medical mm. school in 2001 has been just compelling. Yeah. Um, so really, uh, for the last 15 years, when my patients with inflammatory bowel disease get their diagnosis mm -hmm. and I explain to them about the medications mm -hmm. and the procedures and the immune suppressants and the potential for surgery and how I'm going to see them at clinic every three months for the foreseeable future, for the long term. Mm. Um, patients with inflammatory bowel disease, just like all my patients with GI issues, but predominantly my patients with inflammatory bowel disease, ask me, well, is there anything I can do with diet? And so I've been striving during my career sure. to get familiar with the research so I can give my patients evidence-based answers. Fantastic. Fantastic. And, and what did you find when you got through the research? Well, I, I guess um, one striking thing was like many of these diseases of, um, I guess, the countries where we eat the standard westernized, westernized diet, um, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease mm. were almost unheard of a century ago. That's true. And really emerged in the kind of post-war 20th century in Europe and the United States. And even then they were quite rare. Yeah. But as we look at the um, demographic data, the longitudinal studies during the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, right up to Japan in the 90s, mm -hmm. where IBD emerged, mm -hmm. um, we see really strong correlations between increasing consumption of animal products, yep. increasing consumption of dairy, mm -hmm. and increasing consumption of processed foods, emulsifiers, yes. artificial flavors, Correct. as well as reduced intake of dietary fiber. Yes. So as those things swing, mm -hmm. inflammatory bowel disease emerges. So we had it in Europe, um, post-war, we had it in the US post-war, mm -hmm. and more recently we had it in Japan in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and now we're seeing it in countries like Egypt, where inflammatory bowel disease is emerging. We're now, we're now in the 21st century, we're seeing it in countries like Saudi, yes. where they're trying to recruit gastroenterologists to help them treat inflammatory bowel disease, because mm -hmm. they just don't have that experience, but the disease is emerging. Right, right, fantastic. And so in your experience uh, and, and your research, we just want to touch on some of the things that you know, we get asked about a lot. Um, the first thing we get asked a lot about mm. is the gut microbiome. Sure. And you know, obviously it plays a big role in 
your overall health. Absolutely. Uh, so talk to us about the research around plant-based diets and the gut microbiome. Well, the, the gut microbiome. So I always say to people, we are not alone. Okay, we think we're alone, <laughs> but you're not. You got like two or 300 trillion microbes living in your gastrointestinal tract. In, mm. in fact, our whole body is teeming with microbes. Correct. Um, but yeah. most of them live within our GI tract. Yes. And they've been with the human species since the dawn of human evolution. And they've been with each one of us since the day we were born. Mm. And each of us are carrying about one and a half to two kilos of microbes, predominantly within our GI system. Right. And those microbes have incredibly important functions. In many ways, they're sort of an adaptable and unique organ of their own. Mm. And medicine is recognizing that more and more and more because the, through the gut microbiome functions, for example, in producing short chain fatty acids, which reduce our risk of inflammation mm -hmm. and autoimmune diseases, mm -hmm. obesity, type two diabetes, um, through the production of potentially harmful substances like trimethylamine, which is metabolized to trimethylamine oxid, oxi, oxide, or Oxy. TMAO, Sorry. which increases our risk of coronary vascular disease and kidney disease and stroke. Mm -hmm. And through all these incredible functions, um, the gut microbiome in many ways has been described as kind of an unlicensed drug factory. Mm -hmm. So the substances that our gut microbiome produces have a very real, almost pharmacological effect on our overall right. health. And study after study after study, whether it's looking at inflammatory bowel disease, where it's looking at the overall gut microbiome, whether it's looking at coronary vascular disease or peripheral vascular disease, mm. um, the message that we're seeing is the more plants we have in our diet and the greater diversity of plants in our diet, mm -hmm. the more healthy and diverse and functional our gut microbiome is. Right. So that's a keystone, not just for gut health, but mm. for overall health. That was fantastic, and it's really interesting to see all the new research, isn't it, about mm. how the, the microbiome has an effect on our health. Now, in terms of the microbiome, I know that it's affected a lot by some the foods that we eat. So what kind of foods you know, would promote a healthy gut microflora, and what wouldn't? Yeah, so I think um, in terms of what promotes a healthy gut uh, microflora, the American Gut Project tells us a lot about that. Mm -hmm. um, so the American Gut, gut Project was a citizen, science, uh, citizen scientist endeavor, where the scientists asked uh, volunteers to complete detailed health questionnaires about diet, lifestyle, medication use, et cetera, et cetera, and also analyze their gut microbiome. Right. And what they found that the number one predictor of a healthy and diverse gut microbiome is the number and diversity of plants in our diet. Yep. So I mentioned that already as yes. being an absolute keystone. Yes. A really interesting study um, published out of Harvard in 2015, mm -hmm. 2014 or 15, I'll have to check that, sure. um, showed us really nicely the effects that our diet has on the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. So you may, might be familiar with this research. They took a number, they took some healthy volunteers, mm -hmm. omnivores at baseline, mm -hmm. and for four days they put them on a completely plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. Something that would be familiar to you guys, I'm sure. There was a lot of fruit, veg, and legumes. Right. There was no dairy, no meat. In fact, I don't think they had any added oils early right. either. So it's a pretty healthy whole food plant-based diet, just for sure. four days. Sure. And they looked at their gut microbiome, mm. and what they saw was a significant increase in numbers and diversity of the gut microbiome. Right with a rapid increase in the bacteria that produce short-chain fatty acids and increasing levels of protective substances like mm. butyrate and propionate, mm. the stuff you want. Right. They took the same volunteers and they put them on what we would now probably call the carnivore diet. Ah, okay. So they put them on a diet for four days where they were mm. consuming exclusively animal products. Right. Now that was an extreme version of a carnivorous diet. Yes. Okay? There were no, yes. no fruit, no veg, Etc. So extremely carnivorous diet, mm -hmm. lots of dairy, lots of bacon, etc. Right. And within four days of that extremely animal heavy diet, they saw pretty extreme changes in the gut microbiome. Right. Now those researchers saw a reduction in um, diversity, reduction in numbers in the gut microbiome. They saw a reduction in the protective substances that we mentioned earlier, right. as you'd expect, because yep. your gut bacteria need uh, fiber from fiber. plants to make those protective substances. Yes. But those um, researchers weren't specifically looking at inflammatory bowel disease, right. but what they did identify was there was an outgrowth of certain bacteria which have been linked to the etiology of inflammatory bowel disease, particularly, Crohn, or particularly uh, ulcerative colitis, yes. um, these bile-loving bacteria. Right. So a heavy animal intake causes a lot of bile secretion, 
causes a change in your gut microbiome, right. promotes bacteria like Bilophilia wadsworthia and other bacteria that have been linked to inflammatory bowel disease. Right. And in fact, those researchers um, commented an unexpected result of their study hmm. looking at the gut microbiome was that they had demonstrated a mechanistic link between the known association between high intake of meat and dairy and the increasing incidence of inflammatory bowel disease. Wow. Wow, that's massive. Yeah, that's yeah. microbiome research at its best. <laughs> that is incredible. <laughs> now, just as we close this interview, mm. you know, obviously you get a lot of people coming to see you, they have IBD. Mm. What kind of advice would you give someone? I mean, they've just been diagnosed uh, and they're looking to possibly look at diet as an yep. option. Uh, what kind of advice do you give a new patient? Well, to be honest, I think mm. I give patient, uh, my patient with IBD the same advice that I give my patients with irritable bowel syndrome, or my patients with obesity, or my patients with diverticular disease, or my patients with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or fatty liver disease. Mm. And the first thing I do is find out where they are. Yes. Because in order to promote change, first you've got to meet people where they are. Of course. So we know that, I mean, I live and work in the UK, I'm from Ireland originally, but we know in the UK, same in Ireland, probably same here in Australia, same in the US, yes. that the diet is far from ideal, right? Yeah. So we get about half our calories from ultra-processed foods, which yes. have no fiber, no phytonutrients, no beneficial substances in them, mm -hmm. which are packed full of artificial flavors, flavor enhancers, emulsifiers. Correct. We don't eat enough fruit and vegetables. Some people don't eat any whole grains. Some people consume an awful lot of dairy. Mm -hmm. So just with my patients with IBD, just like all my patients, my starting point is, how many pieces of fruit do you eat, eat, eat per day? Mm -hmm. How many servings of whole grains do you eat per day? Mm -hmm. And um, how much meat do you consume? Right. And that's, you know, so fruit and veg, meat and whole grains. Mm. And that's the starting point. Yes. Because at the start of the conversation, when someone is just dealing with a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease, and they're already having information overload. Yes. They were previously well, now they're not well. As you know, the median age for diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease is about 30. Yeah. These are generally people in their prime, they're busy, they're working, they've often got kids, jobs, mortgages, mm. and suddenly they've been diagnosed with a chronic disease. Mm. And while they have to deal with medications, procedures, doctor's appointments, imaging studies, it yeah. can be pretty overwhelming. And not only so, that, but you've also got this this big diagnosis just hit you out of nowhere. Yeah, absolutely. And it can, be, can affect you mentally too, can't Oh yeah, it? absolutely. Yeah. They've got so much to deal with yeah. that when, it, when they ask me, what can I do with diet? And they almost always do. I just find out where they are and start yeah. the conversation. Right. So I don't have my patients with inflammatory bowel disease convert to a whole food plant-based diet overnight. Sure. And to be honest, I would think that the majority of my patients don't shift to a completely whole food plant-based diet which is like the diet that I eat and I think you guys eat. Yes. But many people just aren't ready to make that complete shift. But I want them to get as plant-based as possible. And often the first, the easy win mm. is to take dairy out. Yes. Um, particularly um, for ulcerative colitis, mm. um, there's a high incidence of lactose intolerance yes. um, among people with inflammatory bowel disease. And the elimination of dairy has been around as a treatment for inflammatory bowel disease yeah. since the 60s. Yeah. So Professor Sidney Trulove, one of the pioneers of diagnosing and treating inflammatory bowel disease at Oxford University, where I trained for a while, mm -hmm. um, wrote a paper in 1963, whereby he'd identified a subset of his patients mm -hmm. with this new confusing disorder, right. ulcerative colitis, who weren't responding to standard treatment, right. which at that time was predominantly steroid-based. Uh -huh. But he identified that if he got his difficult cases to quit dairy, they usually got better. Mm. So that's a very old treatment for inflammatory bowel disease. And although Sidney Trulove was using that maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago, mm. we now know the science behind that. Uh, we know why it works. Yes. And my patients notice a, generally notice a pretty immediate benefit just from that one intervention. Fantastic. Wow, that was some powerful information. And yeah, I mean, taking away dairy, I think, is generally the first step, I think, for anybody, not only if you've mm. got a IBD. It's, Absolutely. It's, uh, and you know, be, before we wrap up, the thing I would, I would say to, to you guys and to your clients and mm. the people watching this mm. is that although I get a lot of messages from people who are seeing a gastroenterologist yes. who feels that diet has nothing to do with inflammatory bowel disease, I, I get it. There's mm. so much to remember in gastroenterology. Yeah. As we discussed earlier, there's so many new medications, there's yes. new procedures, yes. um, there's new options for patients. Trying to stay on top of all the research is challenging. Mm. But the good news is that the benefits of a diet that limits or eliminates meat and dairy includes fiber, particularly fiber from fruit, 
Um, the benefits of that style of eating for inflammatory bowel disease, but in preventing and treating, mm. is entering the mainstream. So there was a nice review in GUT, uh, the journal GUT, mm -hmm. which is the National Geographic for Gastroenterologists, <laughs> which was published last year. Yeah. Um, the title of that paper was The Role of Diet in the Etiology and Treatment of Inflammatory Bowel Disease. It gave a really nice review. Mm -hmm. Everything I've said today is completely consistent with that mainstream journal. Right. And when I attend mainstream conferences on gastroenterology now, mm. I'm seeing the phrase plant-based diet right. mentioned in numerous sessions, right. whether that's an inflammatory bowel disease, whether that's on uh, colon cancer, whether that's on uh, fatty liver disease, the benefits of plant-based diet are entering the mainstream. Right. So I think in the future, you, your gastroenterologist will know what you're talking about. <laughs> and if they don't know right now, please keep working with them yeah. and you can educate them and you can become a team. Of course you can, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. No, it's a pleasure, I really enjoyed uh, it. We are so excited to meet you. And uh, for everyone watching this video, if you'd like to follow some of the work that Dr. Desmond is doing, uh, you can follow him on Instagram at Devon Gut Doctor, and we're going to put the link to his Instagram page in the description of this video. So once again, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure.